Okay, so if you have anything to say, think about it. <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. Anything you have to say, say it, and we'll talk about it. Either that or we'll throw you out. No. Um, you know, yeah, okay, just let me bullshit a little bit first, okay? Ah, no, forget it. Go ahead. I'll bullshit in the middle of it. <laughs> so there's a gentleman with the mic back there well, with a hand up. Put your hand up and they can hit you with the microphone. Way in the back. No? You gave it to somebody already? I, I'm not in charge here, just so you know. <laughs> yep. Good. Okay, I can hear you. Thank, Thank you. You. Uh, you made a lot of songs of... Hold on one second. Uh, is it possible to get the house lights up a little bit? Would that work? Uh... Okay, I can see now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I found a lot of songs from you uh, on YouTube, but I don't find any Ganesh mantra. And I want to ask, is there something Hanuman guys don't do Ganesh mantras or? Uh... <laughs> There's a very strict rule. No elephants where there's monkeys. No, you know, uh, in the north where I mostly live, uh, Ganesh is not worshiped as, as, in, as big time as in the south. But of course, everywhere there's a Ganesh temple. So, you know, it's just that people I hung out with just didn't sing Ganesh mantras, so I just never sing them. <laughs> but there's no big reason. Uh, Hanumanji and Ganesh are in very ways very similar. They both considered to be uh, protectors and remover of obstacles and, and calamities. And, saving us from many different kinds of problems that we face in life. And um, Ganesha is Shiva's son, and Hanuman is actually an incarnation of Shiva, a form of Shiva. So, you know, one size fits all. <laughs> yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, you know, you have to have the mic. I don't know what they're doing here. First off, thank you so much for being here this evening and for doing this. My question to you is about Maharaji and your relationship to him at this point in your life. Do you still feel him? Do you still dream of him? How do you receive his guidance now? And you want me to answer that in one day or in three hours? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> um, these days, we don't see his body, but that doesn't mean it's not somewhere else. He's just not showing it. And so there's nothing I can do about that. I tried. I ran through the jungle. It was 150 degrees, I mean, like 45 degrees, and I'm running through the jungles looking for him, and I almost killed myself. And I realized, wait a minute, you know, I didn't bring myself to him in the first place. I'm not going to find him myself either. He's got to find me. So, I, you know, when I went to India, well, first of all, I met Maharaji when I met Ramdas in America after his first visit to India. I walked into the room where Ramdas was sitting. I had gone up to see him at his father's place. And just walking into that room without a word being spoken, without eye contact or anything, boom, 
something happened inside of me and at that moment, hey, I'm not going to fight with you. <laughs> You're too big. Uh, I walked into that room and uh, I knew immediately, I knew that whatever it was I was looking for was real. Now, these days there's a yoga studio on every block. There's billions of books about this stuff. But in those days, the dark ages, there was nothing. There were like three books in, in America. And yoga, nobody even heard of it. So I had read the three books <laughs> a hundred times. And, uh, but still, you know, it's a book. But when I walked into that room, it became real. I realized it was real. And I knew you could find it. This all happened in the split, you know, boom. One of these Brazilian things. It happened just like that. <laughs> he does it better than me because he's a real Brazilian. I'm a fake one. I knew it was real. I knew you could find it. And that was just life changing, you know. And from that moment on, I was inside of Maharaji. He was, it wasn't like he was everywhere. He was every, it was, he was everywhere. He is everywhere. He's, and I was just moving in him wherever I went. There he is. And when I went to India, that got totally fucked up. I got attached to his body. It ruined my life. Ha, ha, ha. That was a joke. But it changed my life. Because before, I remember when I first walked into the room where he was sitting, it was like, how does all that fit in there? You know, wrapped up in his blanket. How does the whole universe fit inside of that? It was very confusing. But in about a quarter of a second, I fell in love with him, with his, that form. And then that was that. And then he disappeared. And then that was hard, because I had gotten very attached to his physical presence. And not only that, being with him physically was the only time that I felt loved and love. I had never felt like that before. And so when he first disappeared, it was very hard for me. Because where was I going to go to find that, you know? It never occurred to me I might look inside. Nah. So for, there was a long time of a lot of suffering for me. A lot of despair, like that, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah, 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 enough already. So, but then I had a, a, some different, I went to India um, many times, but uh, I had a couple of very deep experiences there which completely rewired me. And um, my, I, I, re, I opened up again. I, I opened up again. He opened me up again. I, I couldn't do it myself. There was no way I could do it because I was the problem. So how, what do I do? How do you pick yourself up like this, you know? I can't do it. So, uh, and from that point on, I began to feel him within and everywhere also, again. And, and it's just a continually deepening process. It, there's no bottom to it. It's, it just gets deeper and more all-encompassing and more everywhere, more in everyone, as much as I let it. But I'm really stubborn. So I don't let it that much. 
but I do. So, and you know, you understand these great beings, they don't think they're their, that they are their bodies. These are, they inhabit that vehicle for the sake of the devotees, for the sake of the people who need to see something like that. If you don't need it, if it's not the right thing, you won't run into a body like that. Because that's the other thing. It's hard to believe, and I'm not sure if I really believe it myself, totally. But this world, the universe, the, 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 the The deepest quality of this universe is love and compassion. It doesn't seem like that when you read the papers. But everything that happens here is for our sake, is to help us grow, help us learn, help us open, help us find deeper reality. And that's a hard pill to swallow for most of us, because there's so much suffering, so much pain. Everywhere you look, even in the mirror. But, so what I was saying, is, everything that these great beings do is for our sake, for our benefit. They have no agenda of their own because there's no one in there. There's no separate self, no identification with the separate self anymore. They've become one with the universe and everything that happens through them is for the benefit of the people that they're connected to. So if you meet a guru in a body, that's good. If you don't, that's good. I'm sorry. Uh, I wouldn't wish what I went through, the attachment I had for his body, and what I went through. I didn't sing with people for 21 years. Should I say that again? 21 years. I did not and could not chant from the heart. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, probably. Maybe just a little bit. So, Guru, God, and Self are not different. Capital S, Self, Soul, Being. But yet one has to experience that. It's not something you can read about and learn about and understand intellectually. We have to wake up to that, wake up from the dream that we're in right now. And then we have that experience ourselves. No one can give it to us. No one can, we have to, the, the light can be, the, the path can be shown to us, but we have to walk it. So for me, he's the path, he's the goal, he's the whole thing, most of the time. Sometimes at three o'clock when I'm channel surfing, you know, I'd rather watch TV, but even then he's there. All I have to do is look, remember. And that's the same for everybody. Problem is we don't know how to look. We don't know where to look. Even if we want to look, we don't know how to do that. But if you want it, it'll come. For sure. And in fact, as much as we want it, it's already here. We could say, we want this, we want that, we want that. Oh, I want God, I love God so much. 
you know, can I have another burger, please? You know, a veggie burger. We, we say we, we think we want things, but we, we want a lot of things. We think we want love, but we, we'll settle for pleasure most of the time. Love and pleasure are two different things. Happiness and pleasure are two different things. So. And you know, when we got, we got to India, we, we didn't know about the culture. How do you do this? How do you, you know, how, how do you go from here to there? How do you, how do you? So we watched the Indian people, uh, how they related to Maharaji, how they, what they did, you know. And one guy in the group was really smart. He saw that the Indian devotees would like buy some soft apples and cut them up in pieces and slices and, and offer them to Maharaji. And he would take them. He had like three teeth. So he would take these soft apples. And so this guy one day decides, he goes and gets these apples. He peels them, slices it up, and he goes into the room and offers them to Maharaji. He said the look on Maharaji's face when he offered the apples so would be like the look on your face if your dog sat up and started talking to you. <laughs> ah. But you know, I had to get over a lot of stuff. I had to go through a lot of stuff. Still go through it. Because it's only our stuff. When I started chanting with people, which was like in, <clears throat> when was it, 1994, I think, originally, it was because I had this epiphany in my room that if I did not start, if I did not sing with people, I would never be able to clean out the dark shadows in my own heart. And the understanding was very clear that it was only, the suffering was only because of those shadows, those dark corners that I didn't want to deal with, that were pushing me around. So that's why I started singing, that's why I still sing. And Hanuman Chalisa, which I sing all the time. You know, we, we came to the temple from the nearby town every day. And every time we came into the temple, we were given this little yellow booklet with a picture of a flying monkey on it. I had a hundred of those booklets in my room back at the hotel when one day I said to the guy who was giving it to me, I said, oh, uh, by the way, what is this? Hello. <laughs> he said, oh, this is a, it's a prayer to Hanumanji. Oh, really? So then I thought, okay, if we learn this, we could sing it to Maharaji. Because we knew secretly he wanted to spend more time with the Westerners. <laughs> we wanted to help him. So... Uh, we actually, that summer, that rainy season, we got sent away to the, further into the mountains because Ramdas had arranged for this Buddhist meditation teacher to come up and spend like three months with us up in the mountains. And we were just going to meditate our asses off, you know. And it turns out he couldn't come. So Maharaji just sent us up anyway, you know. And we stayed, we were like, you know, all summer we were like four hours away from him. And we go, what? Anyway, so while we were there, uh, me and this other guy, we went through the, the Chalisa letter by letter. We didn't speak Hindi. We had to learn the alphabet, the letters, yeah, how do you do you know, that? And then we transliterated it, wrote it all out. Somebody taught us a melody. And when we came back, we, um, we decided we were going to surprise him. Right. 
he who knows everything. We were going to surprise him. <laughs> so we arranged like on a Tuesday, which is Hanuman's day, we were going to get, we got 80 pounds of laddus delivered to the temple. We had all these fancy metal plates and the RT lamps and the whole thing. We were going to do the first official puja done to Maharaji by the Westerners in this known universe. And it was all arranged for Tuesday. So we're in the temple on Monday, as usual. And he comes bashing through the doors of his room. He, he walked like a two-year-old. He's like, you know. He sits down and he goes, Hanuman Chalisa, sing it now. <laughs> so we ran and got our books. We didn't have it memorized, you know. And I'm sitting there reading. And so I, it was one word, Bidyawan, which I, Bidyawana, I said. He tried to correct me. I went, huh? He went, don't worry, don't worry, just sing, just sing. He never corrected me again. He never even tried. <laughs> So we would, we would, the Indian people would be surrounding him and asking him for this and that. They want a son, they want a daughter, they want a job, they want a car, they want this. So he would, he'd call the Westerners and we'd push the Indian people out of the way and we'd sing it and we'd sing and he'd close his eyes like this. And you know, in India, you, ha you respect the person's airspace. You never step over somebody. So we were so tightly packed, the Indian people couldn't even get to him. You know, it was like a wall. A wall of Westerners, you know, big fat white bodies, you know, yeah, can't get through this. And he loved it. He did it on purpose. And they, Baba, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. He'd sit there like this. So it became a way that we could come into his presence. We could be with him because he would call us. We were like a troop of performing monkeys, really. He would call, we come here and down, she, Ram, day, Ram, day. You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> but as it turned out, of course, he, he, <clears throat> it became a way to spend time with him, to enter his presence. And it's the same for me now, all these years later, when I sing, this is the deepest uh, practice for me of entering into, my, into that depth of that being, of that love. It's just a little different now, but it's the same. Next victim. Hello. Hello. You can sit down, you know, I'm sitting down. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, a more less religious topic. Um, um, I want to ask something about... Wait a religion. second, we haven't said anything about religion. Okay. Give me a break. A more yeah, okay. Topic. Go ahead. Um, but first, uh, let me thank you, the, the family with the, with the kid. Um, I'm, very, thank you very much. Um, during the chanting, I was reminded of my own kids, and I felt this uh, a lot of love. And um, yeah, it's just really, really great to to have have a kid here around here as well. And also, I need to share this. My uh, today, I saw the first ultrashow picture of my uh, new kid. Um, my wife is carrying right now. And I'm not allowed to tell anybody, so um, <laughs> she's not here right now. Please don't. <laughs> so, um, I'm just full of uh, love, and I need to say that. But my question, so sorry. Um, I have a hard time. Um, I wonder how you do this. Um, it's about money, and I wonder how you charge people, not you, especially, not you specifically. But like in general, how do you charge people for something you offer? Because I feel like I have a lot to give and to offer, but I can't charge the people. Um, 
and I'll give you an example. Um, as a therapist, for example, you deal with social services or health insurance, and you don't ask the money, for, uh, the, the people to give you money. You just it's like an uh, admin thing. But when you give like private lessons, teachers, yeah, we know what therapists do. Yeah. So what are you saying? Um, how do you judge like when you give like private hours? How do you charge people um, in person? Because I, I I'm not able to do this. I rather give uh, lessons for free than charge people. You'd, you'd rather give it for free? Yes. Oh, you have a baby coming? Yes. Yes, I know. I'm a, I'm in a very you're going to give the baby away or you're going to feed him? No, that's, that's the thing. It's not, it's not about that. It's more like no, it is about that. You have a, you have a, this is the West. And in the West, money comes from working. And it's an exchange of services many times. Money is just energy in a certain form. And you are providing a service for someone, helping someone, and they can help you pay, feed your baby. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. In India, it's a little different. Sadhus walk around and they, people give them food. You know, uh, It's a tradition that's thousands of years old. We don't have, Western culture is not thousands of years old. In the West, Money is, 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 an, is a type of energy that's exchanged between people. And um, you don't feel that you want to charge for your services? Is that what you said? Yeah. Um, I'm not a therapist, so I can't talk to you about why you feel that way. I wonder why. If you're helping somebody, you have to live too, you know, don't you? For instance, if, if you wanted me to come to Germany uh, and there was no money involved, I would have to get a little rowboat and I put my harmonium in the rowboat and try to row across the ocean to get here. And then I'd have to walk from maybe Amsterdam. So it would be like 40 years after you invited me that I got here. So. That's kind of why this is the way it is. I, you know, it's funny. Um, I had, I felt kind of like you do at one point, you know. First of all, Maharaji gave everything away. Everything. I mean, you know, his devotees, certain devo he wouldn't take money from, he never took money from the Westerners, actually. Some, one of the Westerners had, we didn't have any, but a few of the Westerners had some money and, one of them kept trying to make a donation, and Maharaji said, nay, nay, nay. And finally he said, why are you trying to give me this little bit of money? Like a thousand dollars, was a lot of money at the time. He said, all the money in the universe is mine. Even the money in America. <laughs> so, but, um, I don't remember what I was saying. Anyhow, so, oh yeah, so, so I had this idea, yeah, I'm not going to, I want to sing with people, I'm not going to charge, and I don't want to charge for it, my heart, you give everything away, I want to give it away. Uh, so I thought, okay, then I need to make money first, in a different way. <clears throat> so I made a lot of money, but I didn't start singing with people until I didn't have the money to take a taxi cab downtown. Every cent that I made disappeared before I started singing with people. And looking back on it, I could see, I can see very clearly that I was deluded. I was really, it was a delusion of my mind. That whole feeling, it wasn't dealing with reality as it is, with the world as it is, not reality, but the world. So I had to learn how to, but when I started singing with people, I sang down to Jiva Mukti every Monday night for free. But like I just told you, then I got invited to California. Well, come out and sing at our place. Well, it's a long walk. <laughs> <laughs> so they charged some money, got me out there. One thing led to another, and it's been going full stop and full, full speed since 1994. It just happened this way. 
So I don't know. I'm not sure what you feel about yourself and why maybe you don't feel worthy of, of, of uh, that kind of exchange with people. Maybe you don't feel that you deserve to have certain things in life. I don't know. You have to think about that. Because if you don't feed your kid, that's a problem. Good luck. Thank you. You're welcome. Ha, <laughs> ha,